Hello, and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. It's been two weeks since George Floyd died after a Minneapolis police officer kneeled on his neck for more than eight minutes. And protests in big cities and small towns have continued to attract crowds across the country. President Trump has so far exacerbated tensions and threatened to deploy the U.S. military to quell protests by American citizens. Now, his standing in the polls and with some high-profile members of his own party are showing signs of weakness. So we're going to talk about how Trump is weathering the current crises politically. We're also going to take a look at the relationship between young protesters and the Democratic Party. Do they support the party or the nominee? And are they likely to vote this fall? And here with me to discuss that are Editor-in-Chief Nate Silver. Hey, Nate. Uh, Hey, everybody. Also with us, senior politics writer Claire Malone. Hey, Claire. Hey, Galen. And managing editor Micah Cohen. Hey, Micah. Hey, Galen. All right. So before we get to Trump's standing in the polls, which seems like everyone's talking about right now, lots of new polls coming out, we are still in the middle of a global pandemic. So let's take a minute to check in on the coronavirus trends as we've been doing these past, I think, three months now. So there's some question as to whether these protests or other activities that are kind of breaking our social distancing will lead to an uptick in cases. Nate, what trends are we seeing generally? And is it too early to tell if the protests are having any effect? So... Let's start with a general question. Um, yeah. In general, there is a mix of good news and more challenging news, right? Um, the good news is that we have pretty consistently seen a decrease in the number of people that are dying, reported as dying each day. Um, that has now fallen to an average of about 800 per day. It's higher during the week, lower during the weekends, but 800 if you take a seven-day average. And that's down from around 2,000 at the peak. Um, the other metrics, though, are are maybe more in a plateau. If you look at the number of new cases, it's more of a plateau. Um, there are more tests being done, so the positive test rate um, has fallen slightly, but not by much. Um, and it's very regionally dependent, um, where in general, some regions that did not get hit hard before. So for example, one state that looks pretty bad right now is Arizona. Didn't have a bad first wave, if you want to call it that, but clearly cases seem to be increasing in Arizona. Um, The South, for all the scrutiny on the South and the media, actually the South did not have very bad outbreaks before, but now you do see some states where where things seem to be growing. Um, You can get in lots of debates about exactly which states are in which categories, but um, if you take the region as a whole, then um, cases are growing a bit, positive tests are, or the positive test rates constant, but still some metrics like hospitalization seem to be increasing in some states. Um, So the problem though is all this data is backward looking by um, a period of a couple of weeks. Um, And so, you know, we don't really know yet um, what effects the protests will have and the protests come at a time when there are much broader reopenings. Um, I'm not sure if on this podcast, but certainly on my Twitter feed, I warned people a few weeks ago about, hey, look, what Georgia and Florida are doing now is a few things are opening. There are not many customers yet, and people are being very careful. We're now in a much deeper phase of reopening where many things are reopening. People are trying to live life back to normal, both in red states and in blue states to some extent. Um, On top of that, you have the protests. Um, So you have a lot of stuff going on. People are now kind of trying to get back more toward normal. Even New York City is opening, reopening in a very tentative way today. But within two weeks, I think restaurants in New York might be open in the city. Um, So, um, so yeah, we are going to get a lot of data on how much different types of events affect transmission. Um, But there seems to be more fatigue with social distancing. There's anecdotal accounts about fatigue with mask wearing even. Um, So, you know, look... If you're just purely backward looking and ignore anything else that's happening, then on balance, you might be somewhat optimistic. But the problem is like, you know, there's (laughs) there's uncertainty here. But the basic math is that if people are engaged in activities that don't involve distancing, then those are all threats to start increasing transmissions again. Yeah. All right. So. Again, as we say often when we check in on the trends in coronavirus cases and deaths, you know, 
we'll keep tracking this and we'll see what happens going forward. But a good marker to put down there to understand how all of these things are affecting. Yeah? Let me add one more ingredient as a show that covers politics and covers the news. Um, the mere fact that all of a sudden there isn't as much focus on COVID could also potentially affect people's behavior. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to get too much into the politics of how kind of public health people have messaged around the protests, but all of a sudden we're seeing a message now about like harm reduction or balancing risks. Um, And it's kind of different than the distance, 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 very consistent message we'd heard before. And the mere fact that, you know, we're not talking as much about COVID could affect behavior too. And that people could just, you know, look, there are a lot of countries around the world where the U S obviously did not do a great job in our lockdown phase. There are other countries that did maybe worse and where cases were actually still growing and they're opening up also. So it's just a matter of like, people I think have decided that like we're doing two or three months of this and then, and then we're kind of done, but there is definitely like a fingers crossed nature to this. The reaction to reopening on um, the liberal end of the spectrum has obviously been, I think, more cautious. Like, if you, even if you look at like the Democrats, right? They're um, they're nervous about doing their convention, whereas Trump is, you know, looking to leave Charlotte because he wants to have an in-person convention. And then, obviously, you know, I think people on the left end of the spectrum are probably more uh, often at those these protests that are happening this week. And it is, you see the real discomfort with public health experts giving a full-throated, like, don't go out to these protests, right? Um, Because you have, you know, you'll have a lot of people, you know, people of color who are in public health, who are in, who are medical professionals who will say, well, I'm weighing the choice here. And I say that the threat to my safety is police violence. And I understand that there's also this epidemic going on, but it's it's a really tough conversation to have as a public health expert, as a medical professional, as a person going to the protests. Um, And I'm not sure how people are reconciling it. I think in some ways people are kind of saying, these are the hierarchies of my needs, this this is the hierarchy of my needs, and I think that I am in more danger from the police than I am from coronavirus. It's also complicated by the fact that, as we all know, um, COVID has, you know, there are higher rates of mortality from COVID among, you know, black communities, the Latino community. So that makes it all the more complicated. I mean, look, I've um, heard a lot of criticism from public health people about, oh, people shouldn't be playing armchair epidemiologists. Um, I think there are a lot of public health people who are playing armchair moral philosopher and armchair sociologist and armchair political scientist. Um, And they would be better off just talking about what are the risks, right? The risks are that if you go outdoors, it's good. Outdoor activity seems to spread it less and people are mostly wearing masks and that's good, but screaming and shouting um, can cause issues. Some people are not wearing masks, a few. Um, also some police activity like tear gas or whatever can potentially spread the virus. I'm just concerned about the messaging that like, that like now there has been some credibility that has been lost with we do have big second waves later on um, and I don't know. I mean, look, I guess I'm going on a little bit of a rant here, but as someone who um, is involved in politics and involved in journalism, um, people like the four of us have like pretty acute ears for picking up on when a message might come across as partisan and when it might not, right? You kind of have to as a journalist, because you're navigating this thicket too. There are lots of debates in journalism, especially around issues like race, right? About what's it mean to be objective, right? But it does mean that you're very sensitive to like listening carefully to messages and having some intuition as much as we are in our own bubble for like how this will be perceived by the average American. And my intuition will be proven right or wrong by the data later on is that that the average American will detect some inconsistency in the message or at the very least detect mixed messages and be a little bit confused by this. And I think there could have been ways to phrase things where, you know what, I actually don't care that much about your opinion about the protests. I want to know about the public health risks, right? And if you say they're not that bad, or if you say there's a way to reduce them, then great, right? But like, I don't know. I I think the average American is going to um, going to be a little bit less inclined to kind of view this advice as being nonpartisan going forward. 
And we've already seen reactions from politicians, Republicans along those lines saying that this is conflicting. So we'll see how much that does kind of trickle down into broader public opinion or if it's already there. But we have a lot to discuss today. So I want to move on and talk about Trump's standing nationally. It's a little less than five months until Election Day. And President Trump is now struggling to address the pandemic and also anti-police violence protests. So how, Claire, would you describe the president's standing with Americans right now? In one word. In one word. Tenuous. Tenuous. Good word. Good word. All right, Michael, what's your one word? No, I'll go last. Nate, what would This is like playing code names. (laughs) Nate, what would your one word be? Worsening. (laughs) But tenuous is great. That's the best word. She won. It's over. Uh, Michael, what's your word? Tenuous is good. Worsening is good. I actually think tenuous understates the, the, his problems a little bit. So I would say, um, I would say crappy. Crappy is what I would okay. say. Uh, well, now we can dig a little bit deeper into this. No, next, so Claire, se- why next tenuous? segment, Galen. We, we next covered se- it. Next segment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, um, <laughs> why? Um, Trump is, so it's interesting to look at polling numbers. Like, you know, they're, you, Trump is still, I think, performing better than Biden on, say, factors that have to do with who's better equipped to deal with the economic recovery, right? Things in that kind of column of, of concerns. Um, but in in what I would categorize as, I guess, like, the leadership columns, uh, which I think a lot of people are worried about in America right now. Um, Trump does not do well. Um, So the idea of handling a pandemic crisis, handling a racial policing crisis, um, Biden kind of gets better marks. And, um, you know, the, the fact that Trump is receiving criticism, has received criticism from members of his own party for things like the clearing of the protesters, the peaceful protesters in Lafayette Square, which, wow, happened last Monday, I think a a few hours after we recorded this podcast, so we didn't actually talk about it. Um, I mean, Trump's received pushback from that from senators, you know, or some of the senators did that thing where they say like, oh, I haven't heard about that, but they say it for like 48 hours afterwards when like they've heard about it, you know, because they are constantly watching TV and having, if they're not scrolling Twitter, their aides are constantly putting a phone in their face and, and telling them what's happening. So none of the Republicans wanted to talk about Trump's leadership failure, right? The kind of um, not at all subtle politics of holding a Bible up in front of a church, Um you know, I mean, just really, really clumsy photo ops. And it's interesting because I was talking with, with someone about this the other week who's, you know, a, a, a Republican. And he said, you know, this is the Republicans are good at image making. Right. Which is why I think this is so irritating to them, right, is that that the Republican Party has been pretty good at like branding itself, at at, at making these um, you know, photo ops, for lack of a better word, or these very niche appeals to demographic groups. And so Trump holding up a Bible in front of evangelicals is just kind of like, really? That's your that's your play? Um, so I think it's frustration with Trump for his lack of leadership. And that, like that, that's kind of how I would put it down. He's still doing OK on the economy parts of stuff. And, you know, we're seeing a little bit of a recovery. Or let's let's not go too far. Um, a little bit of a comeback. But um That's how I would kind of characterize it, is that people are sort of stunned by his performance in the midst of really high pressure situations. All right, Micah, you said crappy. Yeah, I mean, I I, I agree with everything Claire said. I think it's helpful to think about this question in in two different frames. One is, generally speaking, how do Americans feel about Trump and the Trump administration and what the Trump administration is doing? Um, and two, the second frame is, okay, what does that mean for Trump's reelection? Right. Um, and I think when you put aside the reelection part for a second, the numbers are just 
not good for Trump. You know, he's always had pretty mediocre job approval numbers. Those have been um, trending towards the bottom end of a, of a pretty narrow range for the past few years. It's a narrow range, but still it's trending to the bottom of, of that range. Um, he gets negative marks for his handling of the pandemic, which is one of, you know, now the the one or two or three defining things of his presidency. Um, he gets narrow. He gets negative marks for his handling of the protests, um, which again will will likely end up being one of the defining stories of his presidency, or at least his first term. Um, the only, as Claire said, the only area which he gets okay marks is the economy. And if the economy doesn't improve for for a sustained amount of time, you would think that would that would change. I don't know that it will, but who knows? Um, now, does that mean he's destined to lose in November? No. Um, you know, because of the structural advantage Trump is likely to get from the Electoral College, um, and because things can change, then Trump could win. But like that fact, you know, if Trump right now, you know, let's say Trump versus Biden polls show, you know, a few polls recently showed Biden up by like 10 or something, right? High quality phone phone polls, right? If if this race oscillates between like Biden plus four and Biden plus 15, um, that would be reflective of a country, and I'm not saying it will, but that would be reflective of, of a country in which Trump is net unpopular um, and a lot of people think he's doing a bad job on a lot of things. But Trump can still win at, at Biden plus four, right? Trump can still win even at Biden plus five, maybe six. So it's like, uh, eh, eh, eh. I mean, can versus likely are different things. And there is some evidence that like he can um, agreed. Nate Cohn just tweeted this. Um, some of Biden's gains are actually with these kind of marginal white voters, actually. And that maybe actually that might tend to close the Electoral College gap a little bit. I mean, it's possible. Is there a world in which um, Donald Trump loses the popular vote by five points and wins the Electoral College. Yeah, but he'd be a pretty big underdog with a five-point margin. Um, so I want to be pedantic here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. on top of that, we also saw a polls come out this past week, for example, from NBC, the same one that said 80% of voters say things are out of control in the U.S. I know that was a big headline. Also showing that Biden leads by eight points in the battleground states. So it's not just like, oh, nationally, he's leading by 10 or even double digits. Uh, but in the battleground, it's still like a two or three point race. It seems like the battleground states are also following this trend of Biden increasing his lead, right? Yeah, the, the battlegrounds always follow the overall trend. That's kind of not the point. The point is how out of whack are they with with the the national trend? Um, you know, right now, you know, we don't have our polling ed- polling averages up, so I, I don't want to say like what the exact state of the race is, but I still think it's a safe bet that that Trump is. Let me put it this way, actually, because maybe Trump, maybe. Maybe Biden has made gains with some of these groups to lessen the electoral college advantage. Um, I totally, I totally buy that. I think it's more likely that when election day happens, Trump will have an electoral college advantage than Biden will, which is only to say that oftentimes I think when people talk about how Americans feel about Trump, they do it in the context of the election, and in the context of the election. That skews the conversation because likely voters are more right leaning than registered voters who are more right leaning than adults. And the Electoral College, we think, is more right leaning even than likely voters overall. Right. So that's the only point I was making is that to me, the data is pretty unambiguous that people. The majority of the country thinks it is out of control, as you said, Galen. 
Um, but that doesn't foreclose Trump winning re-election, basically. Does this seem like, as people are asking, is this a turning point? Does this high watermark for Biden, is it a new high watermark? Does it show that he's picked up, you know, support from people who he didn't necessarily have a few months ago? Like, is this moment changing the fundamentals of this general election? Well, I think it's changing. It remains to be seen what we'll say, you know, in late October, what the what the the election has been about. But it seems like the election is starting to be about crisis and how leadership handles crisis. So kind of the classic understanding of what a chief executive, a head of state is supposed to do is sort of be this, you know, port in the storm. And um, that could change. I mean, Trump obviously wants it to be about an economic recovery. Um, we'll see what happens with that. I think, you know, obviously Biden has to walk a, a line where he doesn't get painted as Biden doesn't want the economy to come back because he doesn't want Trump to win, right? Like that's which, you know, you can already see that coming out a little bit from the Trump campaign. Um, but I do think fundamentally right now, it is kind of a, a, a leadership election. Um, again, that can change, but it's interesting because like, I don't know, if I'm looking back at what 2016 was, it was kind of a, it was a race and gender election. And this election seems like it will also be a race election. Um, do you Do you guys think that so one thing it seems like the data shows is that there are, at least right now, there are fewer undecided voters showing up in the polls. Um, you know, one reason Trump won, right, was undecided voters swung disproportionately to him in 2016. Um, there are fewer undecided voters in the polls, and Biden is pulling at a higher forget his margin against Trump. He's pulling out a higher share of the vote than Clinton was at this point. I think Harry, our, our friend Harry Enten wrote about that. Is that significant? Do we think, do we think, like part of me wants to say, by, I think we've learned that Biden has a higher ceiling than Clinton did, maybe due to all this turmoil and crises hitting the country, maybe due to gender. Um, but have we learned that? I mean, so, yeah, I mean, look, I, I am inherently worried about talks about ceilings and floors and what that means. Um, but it's definitely relevant that Biden um, and Trump have fewer undecideds than Clinton and Trump had in 2016. It was not just undecideds, by the way, but also you had a Gary Johnson vote yeah. that was actually pretty sizable and some Jill Stein vote. Um, so, yeah, I mean, having, you know. Being ahead 50 to 43 is a lot different than being ahead 44 to 37, which is kind of what we often saw with with Clinton. Um, yeah, look, the general view would be that elections revert toward the mean. Um, it's a little hard to know what the mean is in a country where, you know, I think kind of objectively speaking, there's a lot of disarray in the country right now, right? Um, uh, so in the economy, although I actually got surprisingly good jobs numbers, on Friday. Um, but still, I don't know. I mean, look, if you had an election today, then the polls say Trump would lose in a landslide, right? Now the polls can be wrong. Um, although in this case, it might mean wrong means that Biden wins narrowly and not in a landslide or that Biden wins in a mega tsunami. Who knows, right? Um, but there is a chance that by November that things will have changed, right? Just think about, um, you know, I did not think in on March 1st, actually, there was some worry about coronavirus then, right? But I did not think on February 1st that we're going to be sitting here talking about something called coronavirus and the biggest kind of mass protest since 1968, right? Um, and so more things can change. Um, things can fade from the news cycle. You know, I'm not entirely... I, first of all, I do think there are some changing attitudes around police and like actually pretty radical in some ways transformations about how white Americans in particular feel about racism among the police force. I mean, the protesters should frankly like um, 
feel pretty excited by some of that data on how much public opinion has shifted on these issues. Um, with that said, there is the example of like when you have some mass shooting where support for gun control goes up for a while um, and then it kind of fades and has a half-life and kind of fades in the conversation over time, right? So I, I don't know that um, that these issues are going to be completely top of mind for voters in in November. I mean, you would think COVID would be unless it kind of, because um, it doesn't seem like it's just going to go away. I know of no epidemiological model that says it's just going to disappear spontaneously. Um, maybe it kind of fades into the background and people, frankly, are used to 800 or 1,000 Americans dying a day and it just kind of becomes part of the background noise. So look, Trump was already not doing great. And the two biggest issues are things that he gets very poor marks on. And frankly, I think he's kind of not handled <laughs> very well. I understand why Americans don't like his COVID response. And I understand why um, even before um, uh, anything else, right, there was already great skepticism about how Trump would handle issues related to race relations. It was already like his worst polling issue, pretty much. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I mean, um, well, I just want to ask, I guess last. Yeah. I want to ask lastly here before we move on and talk about the Democratic Party's relationships with these younger protesters is we saw, you know, the Bushes come out with a statement supporting essentially the protests. We saw a former secretary of defense, Mattis, criticize the president for his use of force for that Bible photo op. Uh, we saw Lisa Murkowski say she's struggling with whether or not to vote for the president in the fall. Does Trump losing support from, you know, some of these Republican leaders or even if they end up endorsing Biden, does that change anything? Or, you know, they didn't support him in 2016, so it doesn't make a difference if they support him in 2020. Like, how big of a deal is this? I mean, I, Bush isn't George W. Bush said he's not going to. Uh, there's reports that he's not going to vote for Trump. But my question on all that is like. Does that move the current base of the Republican Party? The Republican Party of Trump in 2020 is very different than the Republican Party that Bush, you know, won a primary in in 2000. Bush wouldn't have won the 2016 primary if he ran his 2000 campaign, you know. Um, so maybe 2020 is just kind of the final period where, you know, you're shaking out the dust and all the Republicans who maybe should have left the party, quote unquote, in 2016 because they disagreed with Trump are sort of like, I've had it. This is the breaking point. Um, now, do those people move white college educated women even more so over to Biden, maybe in certain states? I don't know. But I but I am kind of like it's both surprising that, you know, Colin Powell also, you know, all these all these really high profile former GOP officials saying like, no, not, no, he's not for me. That's extraordinary, but it's also very logical to me because they represented a completely different Republican party. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. And I, I think it, it's amazing in a, in a kind of a historical sweep sort of way. Um, I think there's a big difference between what we're seeing now and what it would take to really have a, a big effect. Like, I think actually this type of thing, you know, Republican Party elder statesmen and elder states women and, 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 you know, even beyond, even beyond like the usual suspects that you would kind of expect to, to not back Trump, you know, if it creeps a little more, like Lisa Murkowski is a little more surprising than Colin Powell, for example, right? Um, but, I think there's a big difference, for example, between voicing reservations about Trump, saying you're not going to vote for Trump and saying you're going to vote for Biden. Like we know that voters do take political cues from political elites. I don't think they take those cues when they're super subtle. Right. And so if you're saying I mean, just in, in, there's also a way in which it just doesn't scan, right? If you're saying, hey, Trump is this once in a lifetime threat to democracy, but I'm not going to vote for Biden. I can't bring myself to do that. Then it's like, well, OK, what, what's really going on here, right? The, the, the last thing I was going to say is like, Claire's absolutely right that, 
you know, Colin Powell, Lisa Murkowski, Mitt Romney are not going to move the Republican base. Um, but the Republican base, Trump's base is 35, 40 percent of the electorate. So it's more it's more a question about, you know, those suburban white women or other swing voters um, who I think they could move if it was a forceful thing. Right. But they don't want right. to. Right. Like these. Sorry, just to, just to hop on for a second. Like. These guys, I mean, if we're taking Bush, he was the he was a goddamn Republican president. <laughs> he's not, he's not, I mean, maybe maybe he'll publicly endorse Biden and I'll eat my shorts. But like this guy all, also probably believes that, you know, four years from now, the party will have a very different nominee or that's like, you know, that's his optimistic thing. And he doesn't want people throwing back in his face like, hey, you endorsed the Democrat last time around. Like, I think that we like. There are people who believe that the trouble that a viable Republican Party that looks different exists beyond Trump. And I would say that a former, you know, Republican not president might believe that. And so you can kind of understand the strategy of them not wanting to endorse Biden, but also saying people can get it. People can read between the lines and say, like, there is another choice. But I, but see, Claire, with this kind of thing, I don't think people do read in between the lines. I guess that's kind of my point is like when you're talking about trying to influence the masses, you know, like big groups of people, um, the stupid people. I mean, I think people are smart enough to sort of see like there's two big candidates. I'm not voting for one of them. It's not. See, to me, it's not even about it's not even about like voters making that interpretation per se. It's more about how is the media covering this story? What is like the general climate? And I guess what I'm saying is to me, it takes to me, to me, it would take like a, you know, when we start seeing like big 42 point font headlines across the Washington Post that say Republican Party abandons Trump, you know, if you had held the election two days after the Access Hollywood tape dropped, I think you, I think Clinton would have won. Right. Um, that's not what we're seeing. You know, there's this New York Times article um, that was just like, you know, former Republican leaders like former speakers Paul D. Ryan and John A. Boehner won't say how they will vote. And some Republicans who are already d disinclined to support Mr. Trump are weighing whether to go beyond backing a third party contender to openly endorse Mr. Biden. Retired military leaders who have guarded their private political views are increasingly voicing their unease about the president's leadership, but are unsure whether to embrace his opponent. All I'm saying is like that kind of tentativeness, I don't think is strong enough to have a big electoral impact, at least. Right. But you would also think that if any of these leaders say, okay, let's take George W. Bush, for example, if he did actually want to endorse Biden, you would probably expect it in the fall, maybe not now. And so if he were to, if he and Laura Bush were to endorse Joe Biden, and no, Claire, you said this is very unlikely, does that make a difference? The full-throated kind of like across the Washington Post, New York Times, it says, you know, former President Bush endorses Joe Biden. Or is the Republican Party so different and maybe independent voters care so little about George W. Bush that it doesn't matter? I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not here to, to make any proclamations. I don't know what it, the, the, the result would be. But like, I think that there's also an argument to be made, perhaps, that even if they don't say, I'm endorsing this person, that apathy could either be, it could also be interpreted as they'll stay home. Voters will stay home, and I'm kind of encouraging you to stay home. Will voters staying home of a certain demographic have an effect on Trump's odds? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, that's kind of like, that's kind of what the, you know, we talk a lot about black voters who stayed home in 2016. Could there be white voters that stay home in 2020 that are that in a way that's bad for Trump. I mean, you kind of saw that in like, I think, I think, don't quote me on this in Alabama in 2017, where, where with some, Roy Moore, yeah. right, with Roy Moore, where some people were like, listen, I'm not going to vote for Doug Jones, the Democrat, but like, I'm not going to vote because I don't want to vote for Roy Moore. Maybe that's a, maybe that's a faction of people and maybe, um, you know, Republican, big names in the Republican party either saying they're voting for Biden or saying that they're they're going to write in, you know, write in their wife's name or whatever. 
um, maybe they'll have an effect on people. I don't know. It's worth keeping in mind that um, Republicans do have other incentives apart from Trump being president, right? Um, if you're a moderate Republican, you might want Trump, if he's going to lose, to lose badly because then that will discredit, in theory, um, his style of politics going forward. Um, you also have races for Congress in both the House and the Senate are competitive this year. And so um, you could kind of like a Democrats for Nixon thing, see some Republicans break with Trump as a way to um, save themselves and try to save um, the Senate or at least um, prevent Democrats from getting gigantic margins where they could do all the public policy stuff that Republicans really don't like. Um, so you could get to a tipping point where um, Trump is seen as a lost cause and then they want to kind of keep pushing him downward. Um, that's not, that's not crazy. Um, I don't think we're there though now in, in June. Let's move on and talk about how young people are thinking about this fall's election as they head out to these protests. Young people have been showing up to anti-police violence protests in large numbers, which is, you know, as we've been discussing, a largely left-leaning crowd. But former Vice President Joe Biden didn't do well with young voters during the primary, and Democratic Party leaders like former President Obama have really been urging protesters that they also have to vote if they want change. So kind of taking this some something of like a conflict or a tension between Biden's appeal with older voters and the more establishment part of the party or more moderate part of the party and all of this energy uh, amongst the more progressive side or the younger part of the party. You know, how do young people right now view the Democratic Party and its presidential nominee, Joe Biden? Tell us what the youths think, Nate. Um... I think the youths are, uh, number one, not that thrilled with Joe Biden, and number two, not that thrilled with the Democratic Party as an institution. I mean, let's not forget that um, in 2016 and 2020, in both years, the kind of age split was the most significant split in the party. Um, now, the youths, though, are also not very big fans of President Donald Trump, um, and they are fans, by and large, of anti-racism and ending, um, trying to end police brutality, right? And so I think in that way, the, um, the protests um, are maybe helping to energize um, a kind of multi-racial coalition of younger liberals. Um, and so, you know, part of the trick for Biden is, can you harness that without um, taking positions that might not be as popular among kind of your independence or whatnot. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, obviously you're, um, if you're Biden, you're not going to, there's not going to be some gigantic wave of enthusiasm from young voters toward Biden, but um, there is a lot of anti-Trump enthusiasm. Yeah. I mean, building on that, like, not to use an English class phrase from college, building on that, Nate. Um, I mean, Obama in 20, 2008, not 2016, Obama in 2008, Obama himself created a lot of youth enthusiasm, right? That was kind of the big thing with the Obama campaign. It like it got cool. It it made it made the kids care about voting again. I don't think Biden's going to be that uh, candidate, but I do wonder if the protests themselves could be that stand-in for like, okay, you're not enthused about Biden, but like the protests are your candidate, right? And so you're gonna you're gonna vote for the guy who's being the most proactive for those protests. You know, like so the protests will be the animating force rather than the candidate it's himself. Um, I could see that happening. Like I could see this being a year where, you know, I think the Black Lives the movement for Black Lives has is is a more um, it's matured since 2014. You know, maybe it could. Um, it could help with registration or turnout efforts, right? Like there's a lot of stuff that's, you know, let's go also go back to, we don't actually know how November's election is really going to look from like the logistics of it. Um, and there's a lot of hurdles to overcome with that, with a vote by mail election, things like that, you know, online organizing. But I could see the protests replacing the candidate in terms of we're enthused, therefore turnout in, no in November. 
Um, and there's the VP pick as well, potentially. If you look at betting markets, they say there's a 70% chance that Biden will pick a African-American woman to be his running mate. Um, do I think, I mean, the youth of America, we're also not huge Kamala Harris fans, for example. Um, but um, that may echo potentially, um, you know, both Kamala Harris and Val Demings have kind of a, a background in law enforcement, right? So could also kind of say, okay, we're deliberately kind of echoing and saying this is an issue we want to put front and center. We want to remind people about the protests. We want to remind people about um, Trump's handling of those, right? Um, so, you know, you may see an echo in the VP pick. Yeah. I mean, what's responsible for this split between older and younger voters in the Democratic Party? And you see it amongst both white voters and in particular black voters where Biden really kind of won that primary and performed really well in South Carolina, at least, based off of large support from black voters and largely older black voters. But then you don't see younger black voters as enthusiastic. They weren't as enthusiastic for Hillary Clinton either. What's going on here? Like, why why is the party so split generationally? The It's it's a super interesting question, and, and I'm not sure, sh- you know, you could spend 200 hours, I think, trying to pick it apart. Um, I I think one of the premise of your part, part of the premise of your question, though, Galen, is important, which is like, I do think it's it's mostly about the Democratic Party um, and not about Biden in particular. Like Biden's basically running about where Clinton did. If you look age group by age group, he's doing a bit better with with older voters. Um, To me, one of the one of the and and Nate and Claire, I think we're getting at this, but one of the defining differences between between young voters and older voters on the left is just their relationship to like institutions and the establishment. And there's there's far less faith in both of those things among among younger voters. I mean, think about if you're a younger voter, right? Um You've now seen the establishment, you know, depending on your age, screw up the Iraq war, screw up the Great Recession, um, continually not respond. Again, we're talking about young voters on the left here um, to gun violence. Um, You've seen them continually not respond to police brutality brutality against vulnerable communities. Um, and now you've seen a, a chaotic response to a pandemic um, and the resulting recession. You know, it's in, in a lot of ways, it's very understandable that they would they wouldn't have a ton of faith in like Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer. Right. Um, so th- that I think is is one of the big differences is just like young voters take it far less for granted that the people in charge have any idea what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Who can, who can blame them? No, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and, and the fact that like, you know, you have, um, for younger people, you don't have the income growth that you used to. Right. Um, totally. So it's, it's, it's tricky. Um, I mean, people have been writing, people have been writing those stories about the, um, since like 2008, 2009 have been writing the stories about like the millennial generation and now I guess Gen Z will never be able to build up the wealth of, you know, Gen X slackers, whatever it might be. Um, and like those, those stories have been like a solid genre of media coverage for the entire decade I've been in media. Yeah. So, I mean, is it fair to say that this is different? Like, do young people always disengage from the voting process and, like, show up in smaller numbers to the polls? Or is there something unique going on here that hasn't happened before? Hmm. I think it's... No, I think it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty normal, normal. For, yeah. for young people, <laughs> A, not to turn out in that big numbers, and also for them not to, like, the establishment, and you know. Thank goodness for that, right? Imagine how sclerotic the establishment would be if, like, if young people were always like, "Oh yeah, this seems great. Let's keep going," <laughs> right? You know, so um, so none of this is that different. It did kind of play out in a way that you had 
unusually large splits um, within the Democratic primary in each of the last two races. It was kind of ironically around Bernie Sanders, who was no spring chicken himself. Um, but, you know, we should say, too, like um, one difference of this first 20 16 is is that Sanders seems to have a warmer relationship with Biden than he had with Clinton and has been I don't want to relitigate 2016 but a little bit less equivocal um in kind of endorsing Biden and and supporting the Democratic nominee and speaking out against Trump and stuff like that and so that might be a factor at the margin as well sorry I actually I I agree with Nate that for the most part young voters you know, not turning it out, not turning it out. Jeez. I agree with Nate that for the most part, young voters not turning out at the rates that older groups do is is normal. And also young voters distrusting the establishment, right, um, is pretty normal. That said, like, as Claire said at the beginning of this segment, Obama was really popular among young voters. They still didn't turn out at, at super high rates. But but Obama or or Bill Clinton, for example, like it is different to have, you know, I think in the case of Obama and Clinton, the last two Democratic presidents, you had the, the Democratic nominee was the candidate who at the very least was acceptable. And in some in some circles was the preferred choice of of young Democrats as opposed to Hillary Clinton and and Joe Biden. So that's different, right? Yeah, I mean, I also think it's the age of the candidates. Yeah. I mean, you know, invite my mom on and we can have a we can have a whole conversation about boomer versus millennial resentment in in Claire, your age nominees. <laughs> oh, she tells me that all the time. Um, <laughs> but but I do think the fact that there has been this kind of, in the Democratic Party in particular, this sort of boomer stranglehold on on who becomes the nominee, and Obama obviously broke out from that. Um, This is not to say that the Republicans are nominating very young people, but I think, you know, people will say at least they were giving, you know, Rubio and Ted Cruz the, you know, they they had gotten the hype for the four years leading up to 2016. Now we all know where that got them. Um, but the idea that the the in addition to being very diverse, this year's Democratic primary field was pretty young, you know, all things considered. Um, and the Democrats ended up choosing, you know, a 76 year old. I, I think Biden's actually too old to be a boomer. Um, so silent generation. What is he silent, a member yeah, of the silent he's... generation? Yeah. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, because he's too young to be a greatest generation. I want to yeah. I want to pitch a reality like a Big Brother style reality show where you get like two or three really like That's my family. We have my dad's the silent generation, my mom's a boomer. I think my oldest brother brothers are Gen X and then the four of us the rest of us are are millennial. Yeah, see that's the Okay, so Claire's family will star in the reality show where you get like two or three people from each generation and then have them compete in challenges and cooperate on try to cooperate on different things. I feel like and talk about their acu- their lifetime acu- accumulated wealth. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, I guess you can get that greenlit by our overlords at ABC. Um, but uh, you know, you brought this up a little bit at the beginning, Nate. But then, how now does Biden kind of straddle? this energy on the left that is pushing for things like defund the police or abolish the police and even some movement on that, you know, on the local level. We saw Minneapolis over the weekend say that it was going to disband its police and put together some kind of different, you know, law enforcement community force, etc. versus, you know, the majority of the party, which is, you know, middle-aged, older, etc. Um is how much of a risk is that for him? And, and is that just like a narrative? Like, oh, well, if he, if he talk if he spends, pays too much energy to the protesters, then he'll lose the older voters and vice versa. Like, is that a real electoral tension there? Um, I think it's actually the part of politics that, um, that Biden is good at, um, is kind of, 
understanding where he can optimize his position relative to different constituencies um, and getting the message out in a way that isn't always the most eloquent or smooth, um, but usually is very functional and practical relative to different forces that are pulling on him. Um, so look, I think um, Joe Biden will not say defund the police. Probably at some point he'll say, no, I do not believe in defunding the police. I do believe, though, in reforming the police, blah, 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 right? And curtailing the power, right? There are some sticky issues around um, police unions that are, I think, interesting and kind of how you handle how you handle those. Um, but no, Biden will um, try to triangulate and he'll probably actually wind up triangulating by taking positions that are um, that are relatively far um, to the left or more radical than what you would have had Obama take, for example, although Obama, you know, depending on who you talk to was, was good on some of those issues. Um, but he'll probably stake out a position that's to the left, but will actually seem to people, um, like it's relatively moderate in part because a people are sympathetic to the cause of police reform and B because, um, cause you'll have the left, right. And Biden will be able to say, Hey, look, I'm not for, you know, abolishing the police that's ridiculous but i am for this right um and so you know that's again i think it's a, that's the stuff that biden i think does not get enough credit for is always finding a way to find the center of gravity um in his party and not seeming like he's extreme um which by the way also has to do with gender and race right like i think a white man can get away with um yeah. um framing a more liberal position or more conservative position as being more moderate um but but yeah, Perry Bacon Jr., um, one of our senior writers, wrote this in a piece about Biden's ide ideology for the site. But if you look back at Biden's record, what really distinguishes it isn't this constant set of beliefs or ideological, um, you know, precepts. Right. It's that he has kind of been in the middle or mainstream of the Democratic Party his entire career. Right. And so the combined forces of the pandemic and the, the resulting recession and the need to respond to those by the government and now these protests, um, the force that will exert on Biden pulling him to the left plus Sanders, right? There is like a good chance that that if Biden wins, he ends up basically as the most liberal Democratic president in in modern u.s history right um which is incredibly fascinating considering he won as the as the moderate right um but he does shift based on the circumstances i mean what's also interesting about all of this stuff is obviously last summer we were all talking about biden and uh his crime bill uh work right he was you know eviscerated by cory booker in particular and then Kamala Harris for basically being bad on race, right? Um, and did get defense in the black, you know, in the black community, like older black activists were right there behind him, Clyburn in particular, um, sort of saying like, you have to understand the politics of the 90s and where we were, where we were at as black communities, not just white politicians in Washington. But it does, I think you can look at this, this situation two ways from the point of view of Biden. It's either your redemption story arc saying I'm on the right side now, I understand my past wrongs, or it's an uncomfortable um, sticking point for you and you get asked questions about your record, why weren't you doing anything about this beforehand and you don't know how to answer it without being defensive, right? And I think there's, you know, there's been a lot of talk in the world and Slack channels and on Twitter and in real life of people saying um, kind of, this white people shouldn't be defensive about what they did in the past. They should change in the future. And Biden's kind of this interesting, perfect encapsulation of what's happening with uh, white politicians in power, white people in power, whatever, white, white majority workplaces, whatever it might be. And he does have a tendency to get defensive when asked about his record on a lot of things, not just race. Um, up until very recently, right? We were talking about Charlemagne the God just a couple podcasts ago. So I am very interested to see how Biden carries on once people 
ask the inevitable questions about his record on race and crime and, and how and how that's different than maybe last summer, which got pretty, you know, ugly for Biden. Um, so I don't know. That's not it's neither here nor there, but it's just something that, I, that I'm certainly watching for in all of this. Um, I mean, one question is, can Trump string together um, coherent messaging that would try to probe these weaknesses against Biden or not? And the not might be either because there's too much other news or because he's Trump and it's just not something that he's necessarily like physically capable of. Um, well, yeah. I mean, remember so, that you know, in 2016, that was a thing, right? We saw ads on social media accusing Hillary Clinton of, you know, super predator, black super predators. Like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so that is, that is like, we have seen that used as a way to try to keep black voters home in the fall. Yes. Um, and, you, you know, I mean, it would I, have yeah. been surprising if that was also a tactic used this fall. But now it's a question of, well, is that uh, um, a useful or workable message after the whole, like, we're going to use the U.S. military against peaceful protesters, et cetera? I mean, it's for some reason, the dynamics are a little bit different where against Clinton, just having this kind of miasma of stuff in the air, right, um, even though it wasn't often very focused, um, was, I think, quite effective, right? Um, but it doesn't feel like the same is true for Biden. I guess people um, are just more inclined to see him as a generic Democrat. By the way, Biden's favorable ratings are not are not actually very good, um, but they're a little better than Trump's, and also people who dislike both candidates are mostly voting they claim for Biden this time. But like, but I do think like um, this general uh, kind of, uh, I don't know. I think Trump needs to be a little bit more surgical with Biden um, because we've seen that stuff doesn't stick to Biden as much. And people give him the benefit of the doubt more. And frankly, the media gives him the benefit of the doubt a little bit more than it did Clinton. Um, and people are mostly focused on Trump anyway with so much going on, right? And so like some Trump tweet about Sleepy Joe. By the way, why is it Sleepy Joe and not Sloppy Joe? Hmm? So I think that last point... But it won't break through as much when there's more news. I, th Sorry. I think that last point from Nate, not the Sloppy Joe one, to be clear. Um, the, point, the point about people are more focused on Trump, I think that's the key point. Um, you know, all the talk about, oh, is it a choice or a referendum? I think that can be overdone. Um, but certainly Trump is the president. And so it's more of a referendum this year than it was in 2016. And to the extent that that's true, then I think just any attack on Biden becomes less less of a motivating factor. Right. And I do to answer Nate's original question. I don't think Trump can do that. I think Trump's campaign can. Um, they've shown a, a pretty smart and ahead of the curve ability to to do this kind of stuff. Um, they'll certainly try it and have been trying it. All right. Well, I think that's where we'll leave things for today, unless anybody else has thoughts on Biden's relationship with the youths and how it relates to these protests. He should start trying to play the saxophone. That would, <laughs> I think that would basically win him the election. Um, like Bill? Oh, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. It worked before. Do you know what? This is really random, but just thinking of Bill Clinton. Recently, I rewatched the, um, the SNL skit where Bill Clinton goes into McDonald's on a campaign <laughs> yeah. stop. It is so funny. And it's just like. It's very. That's a classic. It's also very evocative because I just like have such vivid memories of those styrofoam McDonald's containers, and he's just like oh, chomping yeah. into them. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> go look it up, people. <laughs> um. All right. Well, there's your assignment, listeners. Let's leave it there. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Galen. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Galen. And thank you, Micah. Thank you. My name is Galen Druk. Tony Chow is in the virtual control room. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. 
Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon.